Hi there, and welcome to the second Cheers Zoom reading. I am Ken Levine, and along with my writing partner, David Isaacs, we wrote this episode of Cheers called Death Takes a Holiday on Ice from 1988, and we are going to have a reading of it for you as performed by some of your favorite sportscasters and George Went, who will be playing Norm. So let me introduce you to everybody and what roles they're gonna be playing today. First of all, playing Frazier Crane, we have from the Chicago White Sox, Jason Benetti. Jason also organized this with me. Uh, playing Carla Tortelli from the New York Yankees, Susan Waldman. Playing Rebecca Howe from the Los Angeles Dodgers, Alana Rizzo. And playing Sam Malone from the Atlanta Braves, Chip Carey. <laughs> playing Woody is Mark Grant from the San Diego Padres. Playing Cliff from the San Francisco Giants, we have Dave Fleming. Doing the stage direction, we have Steve Fiziak from the Kansas City Royals. And our guest stars, we have from the Boston Celtics, we have Sean Grandy, who is playing Daryl. Playing Father Barry is Josh Lewin, voice of UCLA football and basketball, formerly of the Chargers, the Yankees, no, not the Yankees, any, every team but the Yankees, the Mets, the Reds, every team but the Modesto Nuts <laughs> and the Yankees. And also, uh, playing the part of Gloria is Meredith, Bar oh man, I'm going to screw this up, uh, Marakovitz. Was that close? Close enough. It counts in my book, Marakovitz. Okay, uh, from, the, from the New York Yankees. And uh, I will be playing the miscellaneous parts, and I was with the Orioles, the Reds, no, not the Red Sox, I was with the Orioles, the Mariners, I wish I was with the Red Sox, and the Padres, and uh, my lifetime win-loss record is 36 and 784, <laughs> which is why I stuck to writing. So here, the Cheers reading of Death Takes a Holiday on Ice. Steve Fiziak, take it away. We fade in inside the bar. Rebecca is going through her mail. Boy, these phone bills are sky high. I've got to change long distance carriers. Now, do I go with the one that charges by the miles or the time of day? Hey, you should just use the one we use. You all use the same one? Yeah, you bet. We swear by it. Which one is it? Sprint? MCI? Cheers phone. Angle on Cliff using the bar phone. Really, Ma? Hey, guys, it's 12 o'clock in Tokyo. Is, uh, is that tomorrow or yesterday? Cliff. Well, what? I'm leaving a quarter. And on Rebecca's expression, we dissolve to the main titles. Act one, fade inside the bar. Several hours later, Woody is tending bar. Sam enters with a good looking jock type, Daryl Mead. Come on in, Daryl. Let me buy you a drink. Well, just one, Sam, then I gotta go. Carla, at the end of the bar, is stunned when she spots Daryl. She stands frozen, her mouth open. What is it, Carla? You look like a wide-mouthed bass. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, a very fetching wide-mouthed bass. Daryl Mead uh, of the Boston Red Sox. I've had the galloping warmies for him for five years, especially in 88 when he led the league in tight-fitting pants. Boy, to know you're the best at something, what an honor. Well, go over and meet him, Carla. Would love his autograph. Maybe I can get him to sign my breast. Carla crosses to Darren and Sam at a downstage table. Yeah, that would complete the team lineup. For whatever reason, Sam, I'm just hitting the ball a ton lately. Well, you're not dragging the bat barrel and you're waiting longer on the breaking pitch. Wow. If you say so. Carla sits down on the edge of Sam's chair. Terrell, this is Carla LeBeck. If she isn't your biggest fan, she could certainly beat up whoever is. Pleasure to meet you, Carla. You seem to know more about me than I do. Well, you spend a couple hours a day going over game tapes in slow motion, you pick up a thing or two. Carla pushes Sam completely off his chair, and he falls to the floor. 
Hey, Sam, while you're up, why don't you get Daryl a drink? What do you want? Whatever will keep you busy the longest. Make it two. Sam crosses to the bar, leaving Daryl and Carla alone. You sure know a lot about baseball. You remind me of my first hitting coach. Yeah, but I look better in black underwear. Yeah, but I bet he can spit tobacco farther. Don't count on it. So, Carla, listen, you want to maybe grab some dinner later? You kidding? I'm there. Oh, no, wait. No, wait, I can't. Damn. Why not? You, you got to work? No, no, no. Gee, I, I don't want you to think less of me, but I'm married. Why would that stop you? Jeez, you're a pig. Now I really <laughs> wish I could go out with you. Okay, well, just in case. He scribbles his number on a slip of paper and sticks it down Carla's blouse. I can't remember when a paper cut felt this good. Hey, Sam, I, I gotta run. Wait, I just finished coring the pineapple for your Mai Tai. Give it to the cutie in the black underwear. Well, I wonder which one he met. Oh, well, it'll be fun finding out. Daryl heads to the door. Anyway, Carla, thanks for the tips. I hope I hit a home run tonight. I swear, if I was single, you'd have one already. Daryl exits. Carla approaches the bar and hands Rebecca the slip of paper from her blouse. Rebecca, this piece of paper is my ticket to eternal damnation, so do me a favor. Put it in the safe and never give it to me. No matter what I say, no matter how much I beg, do not give me that piece of paper. All right. Oh, okay, just let me check that I gave you the right one. Rebecca offers it back. I told you never to give me this. Sorry. Hmm, Daryl Mead's phone number and an interesting drawing. Rebecca exits to the office. The guy with the best buns on the Boston Red Sox asked me to go out and I've got to say no, because you know why? Because life bites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right, true. Sure does. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not fair. I get all the disadvantages of marriage and none of the perks. There are perks? Oh, she's just talking. And Eddie's gone for months at a time and the money he sends back is a joke. I guess the ice show craze of this country is crested, huh? He's never around to help out with the family. And all that would be fine if I could visit him a few for a few bed sprints once in a while, but I don't even get that. Come on, Carla, you're very lucky. Eddie is still a loving, caring, attentive husband. Yeah, one of those jerks who spoils it for the rest of us. I'm not kidding. He doesn't care or pay attention. Carla, I'm sure he does. Oh, yeah? Get this. Graduation is tomorrow. It's the most important day in Anne Marie's life. Or is it Serafina? One of the older kids. Anyway, Eddie's show's about to let out. He always calls about now after skipping a shower and gives me some lame excuse about why he can't show up. The phone rings. Sam answers it. Cheers. Oh, Carla, it's for you. Someone from the ice show. Oh, gee, knock me over with a feather. Be nice. Carla grabs the phone. Okay, what is it this time? Uh-huh. 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 Right. Well, these things happen. Displaying no emotion, she hangs up the phone. Eddie can't make it to the graduation? No, he can't. Well, what's the excuse? He's dead. Oh, that old one. Come on, Carlo. What's his excuse? Oh, no, sweetheart. You're serious. I'm so sorry. Thanks, Sam. I know. What happened? It was a freak accident in the ice show. It happened real sudden. He didn't feel any pain. Okay, table five looks like they're ready to order. As Carla stoically marches off with everyone looking on, very concerned, we dissolve too. Inside the bar later that night. Closing time. Carla is still in the back room. There's a pall over the bar as everyone is still thinking of Eddie and recalling the high points of his life. Sam is on the phone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. We'll all be at the chapel. What was it, Sammy? Well, Carla was right. The performers were coming off the ice after the penguin salsa number, and one of the penguins tripped and fell as the Zamboni machine headed straight for him. Eddie dived and pushed the guy out of the way just in time. And then, well, 
the Zamboni had his number. He was a pro to the end. I remember back when he was playing hockey that night against the Maple Leafs when Eddie stopped. It must have been 40, 50 shots on goal. And counting the 10 that got by him, I, I've never seen a man work that hard. Well, at least he died with his skates on. I wonder how many of us would give his life to save a fellow human being or penguin? Not me. I would. Yeah, me too. Eh, New York Minute, sure. Oh, you guys are brave and unselfish. How many of you had? Marla enters from the back room, carrying a tray of empty glasses. She is still acting as if nothing has happened. I'm going to close up. Carla, we can do that. No, no, it's my turn to clean and wash. Really, Carla, we can spit into the glasses just as well as you do. Carla, will you please let me take you home? Why? Nothing I can do, okay? Let me close up. Carla moves off to clear some tables. Along the lines of what Dr. Crane was saying before, how many of us, when faced with the loss of a loved one, could stay and close up? She's something. Woody, I think she's still in shock. Perhaps I should take the initiative and speak with her. How many of us, when faced with talking to someone who's lost a loved one, would take the initiative and... Woody, please shut up. There's my answer. <laughs> Woody moves on. Frazier crosses to Carla. Carla, if I might offer a bit of professional advice. I'll give you a dollar if you don't. Carla, different individuals react to the loss of a dear one in different ways. As such, your stoic behavior is completely understandable. But research into human nature tells us that we need to grieve. And unless we allow ourselves that emotional release, we can never really get over the loss and successfully move on with our lives. There are people who hold in their grief for literally years. They avoid it. And all they accomplish as a result is to prolong the agony and the sadness and allow it to cast a pall over their own remaining days on this earth. And, oh, mama, mama, why you, why you? <laughs> Frazier blubbers on, we dissolve to inside the funeral parlor, chapel of the Lord mortuary. A memorial service for Eddie is about to begin. The reflective music we hear is O Canada, played on a somber stadium organ. Several men in hockey uniforms walk by the closed casket, slapping it with their sticks as players slap the goalie at the beginning of a game. Several members of the ice show file by. One sets Eddie's penguin head atop the lavish floral arrangement. Our cheers regulars are there. Carla still maintains her stiff upper lip. Father Barry stands before the gathering. And so we, the friends of Guy Edward Lebec, bid him goodbye, secure in the belief that he will rest in eternal peace. We focus on our regulars. Hey, uh, government funerals are so much nicer. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you're still on the clock. You mean when you die, it's going to cost me money? You and every other American taxpayer. Uh, better your funeral than something we can't use. I think this is a very nice service. What do you must have been through plenty of these. What do you mean? Well, you know, with the size of your family and the well, unfortunate things that seem to happen to them. No, Sam, you've got it wrong. Very few of those people were killed. Mostly, they were just maimed. I've got an uncle who's 103. He had both his ears till he was 101. Frazier leans down to Carla. Carla, Carla, it's, it's all right to cry. It's cleansing. It's good for you. Try. Carla's mouth begins to twitch. At this point in the service, I'd like to ask Mrs. Lebec to please step forward. That gets to Carla. For the first time, she breaks down and sobs. She grabs a handkerchief, stands and crosses up Father Barry. As another woman sobbing steps forward as well, they both look at each other and stop. 
I'm sorry, I, I meant his wife to step forward. Carla and Gloria take a step forward, burst into tears, stop and look at each other. <laughs> I, I meant his current wife. They take another step forward, burst into tears, stop and look at each other again. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and we fade out the end of act one. Act two, inside the funeral parlor. Carla and the other woman, we will now know her as Gloria, are still staring at each other. Look at lady, I don't know what you're pulling here, but I'm not amused. Yeah, if you're trying to get a laugh at a funeral, you're gonna have to be a lot funnier than that. Hey, I'm Gloria Lebeck, as in Eddie Lebeck? Who the hell are you? I'm Carla Lebeck, Eddie's poor grieving widow. Hey, honey, I'm Eddie's poor grieving widow. That's impossible. See this? Yeah, well, see this? Yeah, well, see this? Perhaps we should deal with this unfortunate revelation later and continue our memorial. With all due respect, Father, the hell with that noise. Eddie's not going anywhere until I get some answers. Lady, you got a lot of nerve. Me? What about you? I'm his wife. I'm his wife. Wait, wait a minute, ladies, just calm down. Take your seats. I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this if we hear everybody's story. Good idea, Sam. Is there anyone else here who was married to Eddie? No response. Come on, this will be your last chance. Nope, only two? Okay then. Uh, thank you, son. As we reflect on the life of this bewildered young man, he knew exactly what he was doing two years ago. Eddie came to my town with the ice show. And what town would that be? Desperate Hag, Ohio? Carla. Kenosha, Wisconsin. That's where the ice show rehearses. Okay, so he had a fling. It wasn't a fling. Pengy and I just fell in love. <laughs> Pengy? This is crap on a stick. You come in here, I'm interrupting a sacred remembrance of a man's life. Which I'd like to continue. Oh, can it. What are you looking to get out of this? Money? Well, forget it. What do you think they paid a washed up hockey goalie who bounced around from team to team and league to league because he wasn't any good in the first place? These tributes are really something, aren't they? Yeah. I'm not going to stand for that kind of talk about my husband. I told you he's my husband. I had twins by Eddie. So what? So did I. Yikes. Yeah, well, mine don't bark at the moon. <laughs> That's it, lady. You're cruising. Widows, please. Oh, yeah? What are you going to do? Claim to be married to somebody who can beat me up? Hey, if I wanted to, I could beat you up all by myself. Well, want to, babe? Go for it. Hey, 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 leave Mrs. Lebeck alone. She used to sharpen our skates in Kenosha. You leave Mrs. Lebeck alone. I mean the Carla, Mrs. Lebeck. Well, I meant the Gloria, Mrs. Lebeck. Carla. Gloria. Carla. Gloria. A shoving match ensues. Gloria's ice show people versus Carla's supporters. Within minutes, the gloves come off, shirts come off, and an old-fashioned hockey brawl is in full swing. Mourners, mourners, please don't make me use the embalming room as a penalty box. Dissolve too. A few hours later, inside the bar, all the regulars are there except Carla. Woody enters from the pool room holding his jaw. How's that chin, Woody? Uh, better. I'm starting to get some feeling back in my teeth. I'm really sorry, Woody. I thought you were one of those ice people. Uh, I'm sorry too, Miss Howe. I didn't mean to spit blood on your new black dress. This whole day has been so weird. I just can't get past this Eddie thing. I mean, it's one thing to sleep with a couple of babes, or a couple of hundred, but to actually marry both of them? That's sick. Man is capable of all manner of deviant behavior. Of course, now that I have a child to support myself, I say, keep it coming. Carla enters and crosses to behind the bar. Carla, what are you doing here? I had to get out of the house. Walls closing in on you, huh? No, too much broken glass on the floor. Carla starts breaking glasses into the bar. Sam restrains her. 
honey, honey, it's really going to be all fine. It's not going to be fine, Sam. It's never going to be fine again. Nothing in my life makes sense. How could this happen? How could he do this? How could I not know? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with him? How did he know which pants were in which house? How do I know who he really loved? I mean, it was different with Nick. He was scum with hair that grew out of all the wrong places. But Eddie, Eddie was good. And the fact that somebody good loved me made me feel real good. And if now it turns out he wasn't that good, what does that mean that all this time I was just a fool? I'll bet he kept his jeans at your house and his dress slacks at her place. Rebecca approaches Carla and puts her arms around her. Carla, as one woman to another, you weren't a fool. Listen back, before you start giving out advice about love and marriage and, and losing the most important thing in your life, go out and sleep with a guy, why don't you? Poor kid, she's still mourning. Rebecca moves off. Here, Carla, have a seat, sit down, please. I, I gotta find out, Sammy, I gotta find out if he loved me more. But Carla, what difference does it make? At least you know that when he was with you, he loved you. I don't know that. Well, look at it this way. It's not like he was fooling around with another woman. He was married to her. Carla clasps Sam's hands. Sam, I hope I can always count on you to be here for me, even with your useless advice. You know you can. Gloria LeBeck enters. Carla spots her. Ladies, ladies. Hey, what are you doing here? I thought we agreed I was never going to see you again after I let you out of the cremation oven. Shut up, monkey mug. I've got some questions, and I don't think I'll be able to rest until I get the answers. I'm sure you'll have all the answers you need when I scratch you bald, paint your butt blue, and mail you to Panama. Oh, I'd like to see you try. I'd like to see that, too. Look, I didn't come here to deck you cold. I came here to find some answers. I spent my measly life savings to haul all the way down here to Boston for my husband's funeral, and now I find out he was married to another woman. Well, it's always good to get away. I can't go back home without any peace of mind unless I find out the answers to some questions. Well, listen, Gloria, I'd like to help you, but all I got are the same questions. I've also got my life savings, but that was your choice. No, there's one thing you can help me with, and it's why I'm here. I have to know which one of us Eddie loved more. Well, you could have just phoned. Eddie loved me more because he married me before you. I was the first, his true love. Yeah, well, yeah that's, that's true. true. She's got a point. Yeah. Can't argue that. Can't argue that. But you didn't satisfy him. Why else would he marry me? Well, that's a true point. Yeah, mm. yeah, good point. Can't argue that. Okay, I bet the only reason he married a broad like you is because he knocked you up. How did you know that? Because that's the only reason he married a broad like me. Okay, so we're even. Not so fast. With me, it wasn't just a cheap thrill. It was very romantic moment on the hood of a Datsun hatchback. Toyota Corolla, front seat. Ouch. Ladies, ladies, hearing you talk about conceiving your children in those cars makes me sick. Why don't you people buy American anymore? Cliff stalks <laughs> off. Okay, I got the tiebreaker right here in my purse. Be prepared to be smeared. Did Eddie ever write you a poem? A poem? In his own handwriting. Listen to this. To Carla, you're so sweet, you can't be beat. All the other girls eat it. My God, we've lost an artist. Big deal, take a look at this. It's Eddie's favorite picture in the whole world and he gave it to me with his nephews. Don't they look happy? These aren't his nephews, they're my kids and of course they're happy. They just found out they weren't gonna be tried as adults. Ladies, ladies, this is crazy. Maybe Eddie loved both of you so much that he felt the only right and honorable thing to do was to marry both of you and become a bigamist. Or Maybe he was dumber than dirt. Well, he was dumber than dirt. Wasn't he, though? Gordy, a young ex-hockey player, ice show performer, enters. His hand is in a finger splint. Can I help you? Yeah, I'm Gordy Brown. I worked with Eddie LeBeck in the ice show. Wow. 
this bar. It's just like Eddie described it, the stools, the napkins, the liquor. You knew Eddie, huh? Knew him. It saved my life. Yeah, I knew him. Oh, you're the penguin he pushed out of the way of the Zamboni machine. Yeah, I wrenched the hell out of my thumb, too. He didn't have to push me so hard. So what do you want? I tried to tell you about this at the funeral, but someone had their fist in my mouth. Hey, it was her. It's amazing how much damage you can do with a votive candle in your fist. So what did you have to say? <laughs> well, late one night, a couple of months ago, Eddie and I were drinking, and he told me he had a secret, something he felt really guilty about. So he wrote this note, and he told me if anything ever happened to him, I should deliver it to you. Gordy hands the note to Carla, who hands it to Sam. Sam, I can't look at it. You better read it. Dear Carla, I hope you never have to read this, because if you do, it means I'm dead. How are you, eh? I've done a terrible thing. I had to marry another woman. I didn't want to, but I made her pregnant. Oh, I guess I did two bad things then. Anyway, I just want you to know I'm sorry. You'll always be the love of my life, even in death, unless you found out about this and you're the one that killed me. <laughs> Stay loose. Love, Eddie. Well, now we know. I guess it's time for me to go home and start over. Yeah, well. Well, congratulations, Mrs. Lebeck. And I guess this is yours. Thanks. Sure thing. I hope the kid on the left doesn't still have that runny nose. Oh, he only does that for pictures. Could somebody give me a lift to the bus station? You going back home? No, that's where me and my kids have been staying. I don't have enough money to go home. Well, I'll swing you by the bus station. It's almost out of, I'm, I'm almost out of postcards, and it's the only place in town you can find a Zagnut bar. Sam pulls Woody aside and locks him in the closet. Listen, you don't have to go to the bus station. You can stay at my place. No, no, that wouldn't be right. Come on. I got to work late tonight. I could use a babysitter. Serious? Well, we're sort of family. I mean, we're what? Widows-in-law? Well, thank you, Carla. Cliff is leaving now. He'll give you a ride. What? I just ordered a beer. Carla grabs Cliff's mug and in one motion empties its contents into the sink. Boy, that hit the spot. Okay, <laughs> let's go. The key's <laughs> under the mat. And no matter what the twins say, they're not allowed to swing from the good swag lamp. That's the only way I can get mine to go to sleep. Cliff exits, followed by Gloria. Carla, that was a hell of a nice thing to do. Yeah, well, we have a lot in common, although he did love me more. Is the pool room empty? Sure. Good. I want to be alone for a while. Now that I know that Eddie loved me more, I think I can finally say goodbye. Carla exits to the pool room as the gang watches her thoughtfully. From the back, we hear Carla singing wistfully. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. Three balls, side pocket. True patriot love in all our sons command. Six ball, corner. <laughs> As we cut to black, that's the end of act two. Okay. Hey. Thank you all so much for watching. Hey. One more time. Thanks, Ken. Jason Benetti as Frazier. Sean Grandy as Daryl. Josh Lewin as Father Barry. The incomparable Susan Waldman as Carla. <laughs> Alana Rizzo as Rebecca. And Sam Malone, of course, had to be. <laughs> Chip Carey, doing the stage direction, the golden voice of the Royals, Steve Fiziok, and playing Woody with his own microphone, Mark <laughs> Grant, and playing the part of Gloria with Meredith Morakovich.
and playing the part of Cliff would be from the San Francisco Giants, Dave Fleming. And as Norm, we are honored once again to have George Wendt. So thank you all so much for watching. Uh, this is the second one. Uh, if you missed the first one now, go back and watch that one as well. And be safe. Bye-bye.